Hello my wonderful weasels, welcome back to the game cave. I'm Weasel Bandit and today I am very excited to announce this new playlist on my channel. It's a new experiment I've done that I am very excited to see what kind of reception it's going to get. I call it an experiment because whether or not I make more of these depends completely upon how they are received for that single reason that I've never before spent so much time on a single episode for my channel. Usually I spend between an hour or to a maximum of three hours on a normal episode, but this one here... Oh, I think I've spent between 40 and 50 hours in total on making this very episode. So, it's been extremely fun and I'm very pleased with the result, but it's also been a lot of hard work as you may be able to imagine. So, do please tell me if you like it, I'd appreciate it very much. But, the reason that I made this is that... Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what this is, what this is. you're just gonna have to see for yourself. But the reason is that after I uh, redesigned the game cave and extended my range of entertaining materials, I've been wanting to combine some of, of these materials. As my regulars will know, I'm extremely fond of writing and I, I also enjoy making voices and, and of course, well, playing games. So I thought that I'd make something where I could, could do all three. But I, I don't want to take any more of your time, so just sit back and enjoy Skyrim and Taylor. I was invited. There you are. You infernal dragon, he said, raising his voice toward the sky. He hurried to the top of a nearby rock, trying to get a glimpse of where the dragon was flying off to. I will find you. I will follow you through the gates of oblivion if I have to. But the dragon had disappeared behind the thick forest and the distant mountains. The young man stood for a moment, as frozen thinking of the day where he would slay the beast that had claimed the lives of his parents and destroyed his home. The young man's name was Malas. Malas was but a mere boy at the time of his parents' death. He had been working the lumber mill the entire day, just as he usually did. His family had been lumberjacks for six generations and had owned their own mill for four. He had seen from atop the mill how the dragon had soared down, breathing fire upon his family's nearby home and burned it to the ground. Now he followed the dragon. He would follow it to the ends of the earth, and now that it was on the move again, he would have to move out as well. Grabbing his father's axe and picking up all the items he had been keeping at his campsite, he left the site behind and began to move down the mountain. A few days ago, before the death of his parents and his childhood, Malas would have enjoyed the freedom he now had to wander in the forest. He had never been to Skyrim before, but he knew the wild will. He knew that he had nothing to fear from the bug that was attacking him right now. It would simply attempt to assert its dominance and then run along. Malas wanted to run after the beast. Every fiber in his body ached to explode into a sprint and catch up with the beast. But he knew that it would do no good. The dragon could easily cover ten times the distance as he could twice as fast as him. He knew that if he ever were to slay it, he would have to learn patience. He would have to embrace it, use it to his advantage. Even if he caught up with the dragon, he would never be able to defeat it now. He wasn't nearly strong enough or fast enough or had the kinds of weapons that would enable him to kill a dragon. All he had was a longbow, a few dozen arrows, and his father's axe. As the road forked, he came across a signpost. When he looked at the name written on top of the wooden post, he felt the anger in him burn hotter. Those Griffin morons, he sputtered. If only they had listened to me. Two days ago, he had followed the dragon across the border between Skyrim and Cyrodiil. He had a feeling 
that it had settled down in one of the caves in the surrounding mountains, and he had followed the road to the first city he could find. He had spent a whole day in Helgen, trying to convince the Imperial army and the inhabitants that there was a dragon nearby, but they all just laughed at him. But his train of thought was suddenly stopped as he heard a familiar sound. Wolves, he said. This was not what he needed right now. He could handle a wolf all right, but those bastards usually traveled in pairs or more and could prove to become very problematic. But hoping for the best, he traveled onward and soon reached a very peculiar site with three decorated stones set up in a circle. Being the son of a lumberjack, he had never really been told about magic, and he didn't quite understand how it worked or how it could work. He had always thought it to be nothing more but superstition and hokum. But being a little curious, he moved to the center stone, raised his arm, and touched it. As soon as his fingers made contact, he received the feeling of something moving through his body, filling him with some kind of energy that he had never felt before. But it soon became too much for him, and he quickly withdrew his hand, cutting the connection short. Not wanting to stay at this site, he turned around and followed the path along the river. His thoughts once again turned toward the dragon, and how he would ever become powerful enough to slay it. It wasn't that Malas was weak. Despite his adolescent body and his small frame, he had still been strong enough to work the mill by himself while his father worked on something else. But how could he ever stand against a dragon? Looking over the waterfall, he felt a sense of serenity and calm flood over him. It wasn't something he needed to worry about right now. He only needed to worry about getting stronger. For that, he needed help. He needed someone to teach him how to fight, how to defend himself, and he needed better armor and weapons. For that, he needed gold. He thought to himself that there were probably going to be a lot of odd jobs waiting for him in the future if he were to collect enough septims for him to buy weapons and armor. But that didn't matter. Even if it would take him years to collect what he needed and learn the skills that were necessary, he knew that eventually he would find the beast and kill it. Suddenly his thoughts were abrupted once again by the howl of a wolf. This time it sounded closer than before. Could he be walking right toward them? The sound of a second, much louder howl answered his question. He crouched down, wondering if he had the wind in his back, when he saw it. A dead rabbit lying on the ground. He must have interrupted their dinner, he thought, meaning that they were close by, and worse, that they were hungry. Taking out his longbow, he moved forward, very slowly. He wanted to see them before they saw him. Moving slowly through the branches, his eyes were fixed on the hilltop a few dozen feet away. He thought that if they were to show themselves, it would be there. And then he saw it, a single wolf standing on the hill. He took out an arrow, put it on the string and pulled it back while aiming carefully before he finally let go. He missed, but the wolf was disturbed enough to run in the other direction. But suddenly Malas realized that he had been so fixated on the hilltop that he hadn't even seen the other wolf right in front of him. Very slowly, very carefully, he put another arrow to the bow and let go. It hit the wolf square on, and Melas quickly drew another arrow, and before he even realized what had happened, he had shot another arrow into the wolf's body, just as it locked its jaws around his arm. The dead animal led limbs spread eagled on the spot where it had hit the ground. Malas quickly harvested whatever resources he could from the animal, before turning his attention toward the remaining predator. The roaring from the waterfall made it impossible to pinpoint the location of the wolf using sound. So crouching down, Malas directed all his effort into focusing on what he could see in front of him. But the wolf had vanished. He looked around him. It was nowhere to be seen. But Malas wasn't fooled. He knew that these animals, when injured or threatened, retreated until their prey thought it was safe, and then they attacked again. But he wasn't about to let it get the drop on him. And then he saw it, running toward him from behind the trees. He drew another arrow and missed. The animal attacked, but he quickly drew his father's axe with a hard kick to the jaw and a blow to the beast's skull. The wolf howled in pain and then went silent. 
both of the beasts dead. He sheathed the axe and harvested whatever he could from the second wolf. Hurting all over from the injuries afflicted by the wolves, he turned around and continued on the path. He had to reach some kind of settlement soon. The road was too well maintained to simply be out in the middle of nowhere, not to mention that the lanterns by the road were still burning from when they had been fueled during the night. He decided that once he reached civilization, he would try to find a way to stay there until the next day at least, allowing his wounds to heal properly. A few yards in front of him he could see another signpost. From there, he would be able to find out where to go next. Riverwood had to be close by. He had seen that name on both this and the previous signpost. Deciding that this was his best bet, he turned in the direction the sign showed and realized that he was in fact just on the outskirts of the village. Looking forward to some rest and maybe even a warm bed for the night, he began to walk toward the village. Then he thought of something. This village was not that far from Helgen. Perhaps the people there had seen something. Perhaps they even knew if there was some way to get help for him on his mission to kill it. Feeling exhilarated, he walked through the archway, marking the border of the village, and was immediately met by a homey and cozy vibe inside the boundaries of the village. As he walked, he suddenly heard something that felt like ice in his veins. He quickly set off into a sprint to hear more. It was as big as the mountain and black as night. It, it flew right over the barrel. Dragons now, is it? Please, Mug. If you keep on like this, everyone in town will think you're crazy. And I've got better things to do than listen to more of your fantasies. You'll see. Nobody will. But I tell you, I saw a dragon. So this old woman had seen the dragon. Can you tell me more about the dragon? He asked excitedly. Did you hear? The Riverwood trader was wrong. But unfortunately, the old woman's mind seemed to have forgotten about the incident. He knew that he wouldn't get anything useful out of interrogating her further. But if she had seen it, maybe others had as well. Turning to the closest person in sight, a blacksmith working at his workbench, he ascended the stairs onto the blacksmith's patio and approached him. Ain't every day we get visitors in Riverwood. A dragon attacked Helkin and destroyed it, he said, unable to contain himself. What? Dragon? In Helgen? That explains what I saw earlier. Flying down the valley from the south. I was hoping I was wrong about what I thought it was. It flew off this way. You must have seen it. You're right. I saw it. I didn't want to believe my own eyes as often. A dragon. Here in Skyrim. What's this world coming to? First the war. Now dragons. Trouble loves company, they say. The Yara needs to know if there's a dragon on the loose. Riverwood is defenseless. We need to get word to Jarl Balgraf in Whiterun to send whatever soldiers he can. If you'll do that for me, I'll be in your debt. How do I get to Whiterun from here? Cross the river and then head north. You'll see it just past the falls. When you get to White Run, just keep going up. When you get to the top of the hill, the dragon's reach, the Jarl's palace. Thank you, he finally said. Until next time. Thinking about what the blacksmith just said, he figured that it wouldn't hurt to have a Jarl on his side when he went to slay the dragon. He began to run to the other side of the blacksmith's home, trying to find out if he would be able to see White Run from here. But it seemed to be too far away. That would mean even more travel, and more travel would mean that his wounds would need more time to heal. Besides, he had already concluded that he wasn't strong enough to defeat the dragon just yet, and he still didn't have enough gold to buy the weapons he needed. But then, an idea struck him. Setting off into a sprint, he hurried back to Alva the blacksmith. May the gods watch over your battles, friend. Do you need any help around the forge? He asked him. Yes, actually. How about you smith me an iron dagger? Here's everything you need to make one. Go ahead. He was in luck. Mm -hmm. The blacksmith needed help. That meant that he would be able to earn some coin already. Which meant he would soon be closer to his goal. 
trying to remember what little his father had taught him about making his own axe heads. He figured that the same principles applied to the process of dagger making. And within an hour's time, he held a completed iron dagger in his hand. Whatever you need, buy this smear if it's simple and strong. I can forge it. Here is the iron dagger you wanted, he said. Not bad, but it's a little dull. How about you sharpen it up? Just need a bit of metal and the grindstone over there. This he knew how to do. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be able to count if he tried all the times he had sharpened the axe. He knew exactly how to preserve as much of the metal as possible and still making it almost sharp enough to shave with. In almost no time at all, he had a dagger that was sharp enough to draw blood with ease. You looking for a new blade? As you can see, it is quite sharp now, he said, giving the dagger to Elvo. This looks good. You put time into your blades. They'll serve you well when you need them. You want to keep helping? How about you make some armor? Let's start by tanning some leather on the rack. Tanning leather wasn't something he had done before, but he had seen his mother do it enough times to know the basic steps. One of the advantages of living in a secluded self-sufficient lumber mill was that you were taught how to do virtually anything yourself. Anything else I could do for you, sir? You want to keep helping? How about you make some armor? Make sure you have the right raw materials. Make some armor. Got it. Just need to... Um... Yeah. What do you mean by raw materials? Start by tanning some leather on the rack. A lot of weapons and armor need leather for straps, fittings, that kind of thing. Oh, right. I Apparently Elvo had an apprentice, and after waiting on the two to finish talking, he showed Elvo the leather he had made. Whatever you need, buy you smear if it's simple and strong. I can forge it. Ah, good. A lot of weapons and armor need leather for straps, fittings, that kind of thing. Let's see if you can make a hide helmet. Here's the rest of what you need. Now he felt like he was getting somewhere. If he could learn to craft his own helmets and armor, he would be able to have the necessary gear much faster than first anticipated. After a few hours, he had finished the helmet. Here is the iron helmet you wanted, he said, showing off his work. I should hire you to be my assistant at this rate. Let's improve the fit. Take this leather to the workbench over there. Until next time. He'd been working for hours at this point. The wound from the encounter with the wolf still ached, but he wanted to do as much work as he could, hoping to be paid better at the end of the day. I have tempered the hide helmet. You have talent. Keep working at your craft. And you'll be a fine smith one day. Why don't you keep that dagger and helmet? Maybe you'll remember me when you're making Skyforge steel, huh? All right, then. The blacksmith closed down the forge and returned to his home. Malas thought that it would be best to find a bed for himself, too. The stars were already clear on the sky. He ended up being paid with the products he had made. He had a feeling that the blacksmith didn't actually need any help, but instead simply was passionate about his field of work and wanted to pass off some of his knowledge. Well, no matter the case, Milas could see that he was just outside something called the Riverwood Trader, and he figured that he would be able to sell the dagger and helmet for a few coins in the morning. Perhaps if he honed that skill, he would be able to, someday, create armor that could withstand even Dragonfire. If he collected enough septums to buy a horse, he would be able to cover much more ground, and he would have an easier time catching up with the dragon. Making a mental note about that, he realized that he was standing outside something called the Sleeping Giant Inn. This seemed like the right place to find a place to stay for the night. As soon as he walked through the door, he was greeted by the typical thick and sweaty smelling air that could be found in every inn. The place was practically packed with people, but as soon as Malice had entered the room, they all halted their conversations to give the newcomer a thorough look. Even the bartender was surprised over the silence. Orgnar, are you listening? Hard not to. The ale is going bad. We need to get a new batch. Did you hear me? Yep, ale's going bad. 
Within a few moments though, the patrons had returned to their dinner and drinking, and the musicians had started playing his flute again. Malas stood for a moment enjoying the atmosphere before he turned around and headed toward the bar. The innkeeper sized him up during his approach, and finally said when he reached her, You're that visitor, Ben Pokin. I'd like to rent the room, he finally said. Sure thing. It's yours for a day. Having a room at his disposal suited him just fine. He didn't feel particularly social and preferred solitude over company, for tonight at least. He opened the door and entered the room. As usual, it was one of those cheap inns where the innkeeper didn't have their own room, but simply put their own stuff in the cabinets and on the tables of the rooms they rented out, and simply trusted the moral integrity of whoever happened to rent that room. Not even bothering to eat, Malas sat down in the chair and fell asleep on the spot. Several hours later, he was wakened by the sound of one of the old classic sagas. Usually, most patrons stopped whatever they were doing when the tale of Ragnar the Red was being performed, but not being from Skyrim, Malas had no sentiment toward the song, and he swiftly opened the door and went straight for the Riverwood Trader, where upon entering, he found himself overhearing a heated argument. Well, one of us has to do something. I said no. No adventures, no theatrics, no thief chasing. Well, what are you going to do then, huh? Let's hear it. We are done talking about this. Oh, <clears throat> a customer. Sorry, I had to hear that. The arguing parties being silent, he went to talk to the trader. Yeah, well, I don't know what you overheard, but the Riverwood Trader is still open. Feel free to shop. Did something happen? He asked, curious about the argument he had overheard. Uh, yeah. We did have a bit of a, a break in. We still have plenty to sell. Robbers were only after one thing. An ornament. Solid gold in the shape of a dragon's claw. Thinking he might be able to earn some more coin, he said. I could help you get the claw back. You could? I've got some coin coming in from my last shipment. It's yours if you bring my claw back. Now, if you're going to get those thieves, you should head to Bleak Falls Barrow, northwest of town. So this is your plan, Lucan? Yes. So now you don't have to go, do you? Oh, really? Well, I think your new helper here needs a guide. Well, no, I... By the eight, fine. But only to the edge of town. The girl stood up and went through the door so fast that Malice didn't even get a chance to say something to her. But he thought that he'd better sell what he didn't need and buy some supplies before going after her. Show those thieves not to steal from Luke and Valerius. I need to buy some supplies first, he said. Take a look. The two men bartered and argued for a few minutes and then finally settled upon a price. Malas had sold everything he didn't need and had bought an iron mace, which he felt was a little bit better for defending himself than his father's old axe. The girl, Camilla Valerius, waited for him just outside the door. He followed her as she walked out onto the patio. We have to go through town and across the bridge to get to Bleak Falls Barrow. You can see it from here though, the mountain just over the buildings. Seeing his destination, he quickly reviewed his decision-making skills and then followed Those Camilla. Must be mad hiding out there. Those old cliffs are filled with nothing but traps, trolls and who knows what else. Hearing Camilla's word, he now seriously questioned his decision-making skills. As he didn't say anything, she continued. I wonder why they only stole Lucan's golden claw. I mean, we have plenty of things in the shop that are worth just as much coin. Lucan found the claw about a year after he opened the store. He never quite explained where he got it. He's a tricky one. They had now reached the northern edge of the village, and he wondered how much longer Camilla would be escorting him. But just as she reached the bridge, she stopped and said, This is the bridge out of town. The path up the mountain to the northwest leads to Bleak Falls Barrow. I guess I should get back to my brother. He'll throw a fit if I take too long. <laughs> Such a child. Not wanting to be drawn into any sibling quarrels, he simply asked, How much farther do I have to walk? Well, 
Well, it's a winding road up the mountain just ahead. You'll know you're in the right place once you spot the old watchtower. Once you get to the tower, head north. Bleak Falls Barrow should be just around the corner further up. Good luck. Lucan and I will be waiting for you back in the shop. As he watched her walk away, he didn't realize that the whole time they had been walking together was the first time since his parents' death that he hadn't thought about either them or the dragon. Crossing the bridge seemed difficult and exhausting, like walking through mud. His wounds were beginning to heal up nicely, so that couldn't be the reason. He wondered if there was something in his mind that was trying to prevent him from going any further, or if there was something back in the village holding him back. Banishing the thoughts from his mind, he began to think about the road ahead. On one side, he had the road to Bleak Falls Barrow, the opportunity to become stronger, earn some gold and help out the shopkeeper and his sister. The other road led to Whiterun and the opportunity to take action against the beast who murdered his family. What would he do? So I really hope you enjoyed this episode and if you did, please let me know in the comments or by hitting the like button. And of course, if you haven't already done it yet, you can also click the subscribe button to catch the new episodes I put up. This has been an episode in the Game Cave, my name is Weasel Bandit and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.